Awesome. So everything seems to work. Um, so why am I here? Um, I'm basically going to be talking about um, uh, the story of my IoT device. It has um, two threads in it. Basically, the first one is um, how I got my first IoT uh, device. It's a button. I will definitely um, show you a lot about it. But the second and I think more important thre uh, thread here is what you guys can do uh, once you get your own IoT devices, um, if you already have them, um, to stay basically safe, secure, um, to um, to understand uh, what uh, what threats does it bring to your home, and to do all of this um, cost effectively. So you don't want to spend your time reverse engineering some weird CPU or uh, maybe, I mean, it might be your day job, but you don't want to bring it home. You want to do some simple things that will then uh, have a great, uh, a big impact and you will uh, be able to uh, live with whatever new device you bring. So, Okay, so the agenda is, I'm, I'm basically going to be talking about um, four parts. Um, what do you do before you purchase your device? Um, what do you do once you have it uh, with the application? Because most of the devices come with some kind of iOS or Android application. Um, what can you do to the device itself? Uh, understand what's running on it, uh, what electri electronics it contains, whether it contains things you didn't expect it to. Um, and of course, they always talk to some remote server, usually in China, so what you can do to um, you know, protect whatever it is that the device is collecting on you. Um, so who here has uh, an IoT device already? Okay, and who's planning to uh, have one within like the next five years? everyone's hand should be up right now because there's no way um, you will buy, like there are some electronics that you can basically not buy that aren't smart anymore. Like TVs, I think there's no more dumb TVs. Um, and basically everything is going to become IoT. Why? I guess because that's how the world works, right? But we don't have control over it anymore. Like we can stop it and it's better to embrace it than to uh, hope that uh, you know it will go away because it's not going away. Um, so, I mean, I'd really love to hear later in the question phase how you guys have been protecting yourself. But for me, it all started with a problem. Um, I have this uh, habit uh, once in a while. I think, what can I automate? Like. Uh, for example, how can I make my life easier? And I started uh, a new job. I started biking to, to the new job. And when I got home, I had to wait like 30 minutes before uh, I had hot water. So, I mean, it's really a big problem. I know, life and death even. But um, I, it was the first thing that popped out as something easy to automate, right? I mean, you can uh, basically you, you can, the, there are so many ways to solve this. And the, the two main things I found in Israel is first, um, there's only one actual device that will work. There are like two models, but uh, one of them was sold out. And of course you can do it uh, DIY. This is actually a friend of mine and uh, his girlfriend got electrocuted by that. <laughs> and he swears by it, by the way. So as you can see, this is the DIY route, and I'm sure it will, it, it, it's like it, it worked for him, but it took a lot of time, and he really likes to tinker with things like that. I thought, I, have, I don't have any time, I'll spend some money. So I bought uh, this uh, cool device. You will see a GIF of it soon. Um, so uh, that was the only option I had, right, if I didn't wanna elect, buy an electrocution device. Um, it's an Israeli company that uh, that sells it called SmartGrade, uh, but the device is obviously not built uh, in Israel. It's actually uh, built by a company called Broadlink. You can see signs of it everywhere uh, in the, their site, in the app that you download. Uh, it's uh, it, it, like it's 
a f different form factor of all of Broadlink's devices, which uh, are just like manufacture a very popular manufacturer of smart devices. They have uh, different devices that they sell, and apparently they uh, they created a device for the Israeli market that is that thing. I didn't see any documentation about it from anywhere outside of Israel, which I mean, it was fun, but it's also similar to a lot of other devices they manufacture. Um, and this is um, how the unpacking goes. And basically what you have here is uh, a button. It's a glorified button with uh, a few LEDs. Um, it has an actual el electromagnetic relay. So each time you press it on or off, you can hear like a satisfying click, which is very fun. Um, and it has an annoying uh, LED that's always on, and it, it gives my house like a ghostly feeling. Um, and the, the fun part is controlled by an application, of course. The application is called eSmart Home. It is made by Broadlink, by, but the name of the application is com.broadlink.neutralapp. So why is it neutral app? Because apparently it's their um, white label application. So that's what they give companies like uh, SmartGrade and you get the little uh, QR code and then it downloads the logos of the company and then puts it on uh, the actual application. So apparently I had a very uh, white label experience. No, it was very obvious it's Chinese like the everything was in broken English of course and not that I'm maligning it. It's uh, well, I'm going to malign it. <laughs> so this is uh, this is basically what's supposed to do. This is the old um, the old button I had. I replaced it with the new button. Um, that's just how you set it up. Um, it takes uh, AC, um, and you basically put it in a hole in my wall, and it works. Um, so what can you do uh, before you purchase uh, your own device? First. Um, do your research, right? You want to buy a device that's pretty popular. You want to make sure that uh, if you can search for how hackable it is, how documented it is, whether other people already reverse engineered it. Uh, hopefully your market doesn't have only one device of that kind. Um, and you want to see if, if the case is there's only one device of that kind, how many devices are in the family? So the Broadlink family has a lot of devices and it comes into play in a bit. And of course, think about what risks it exposes you, like what personal information uh, can the device collect on you? Um, so this is the Android app. Um, as you can see, it asks for all of Android's permissions, all of them. Um, the weird ones were contacts because, I mean, of course, I want to share my uh, my water status with all my friends. Um, mic and camera, which I mean is pretty self-explanatory. Uh, modify system settings, of course, but reorder um, other apps. I have no idea what that means. Like, wh what can it reorder? It seems very sketchy, right? So, I mean, it, is it really malicious? I mean. Probably not. It's probably not malicious, but once again, it's like, it, we'll see in a bit. It contains like SDKs of every Chinese um, popular site, like map SDKs and WeChat SDKs and things like that. Uh, but, but the fact that it asks for all the permissions, uh, it opens you up to a lot of attacks. For example, if an update, a malicious update occurs, uh, or uh, if there is indeed a vulnerability and uh, the app can be used to, um, to have basically a permission elevation attack. Um, but of course, I still wanted to use my uh, new toy. So I don't want to install the Chinese app, obviously. So I just <laughs> carried a tablet with me, an old tablet, which only had the app with the, like a fake new Gmail account. Um, that wasn't convenient. So let's dig deeper. Let's see what we can. Uh, let's see what we can actually do. So of course you can decompile the app. It's uh, pretty easy. There are even online services to do it, at least for uh, Android. iOS is a different story. Um, so uh, the decompiling it 
worked. I found out there's like 13,000 files and 300 uh, lines of Java code. That's not super helpful, but the, the actual code relating to my device, um, I, I could start to understand it and uh, I could see um, how, you know, the main flows work. Um, but, uh, and basically, I mean, once again, the app itself included a ton of different SDKs, other vendors, uh, code that they support. Um, obviously more code means more vulnerabilities that tens of SDKs of, uh, Chinese companies that do, you know, basically everything that Google does, docs, maps, uh, text, um, text uh, translations, things like that. I have no idea like what device will need maps, but I guess maybe I'm not imaginative enough. Um, the actual control code was obfuscated, but of course, I mean, if you're bored enough, you can, uh, you can start on obfuscating and renaming the functions and everything, but it really gets annoying, especially when you try to reverse engineer something, uh, as huge as this. And so, I mean, at this point I started maybe Googling a bit more uh, and apparently the device family is indeed, uh, popular. So while my, while this device itself doesn't have anything on the internet, like it doesn't outside of Israeli sales site that sell it, it doesn't exist. But, um, the communication APIs of Brotling devices, the, the company that manuf uh, manufactures it, um, were reverse engineered. There's even a Python library. So that made life, uh, really easy, but because of the way this device works, it's a bit different than actual broadening devices. I have no idea why, by the way, we'll see it in a bit. Um, I still had to use the app uh, to activate the device and then I could control it with the uh, Python library, which is like three lines of code. You basically uh, input the library, you uh, initialize the SP2 device, which is just like the name of a device similar to uh, this one, which the internet actually knows about. Um, you authenticate, which sends uh, a token, and uh, basic, and then you set power on or off. Um, I could get rid of the tablet. I set up a simple uh, web server. Uh, I opened up a port on my router that forwarded to my computer, which is uh, silly and don't do that but sometimes you must do that. Um, I used a random URL because I didn't want random uh, internet crawlers to uh, turn, or, uh, turn my water heater on or off. It's actually like once you put something on the internet, you know that like after two minutes, you start getting weird crawlers trying to understand if it's WordPress or some other popular, um, some other popular uh, site that it can hack. So that was fun seeing uh, all those people trying to uh, crawl me. And then basically I could uh, throw the tablet away and uh, hope my ISP doesn't change my IP. Um, there are ways around that too. There's a dynamic DNS, Dean DNS. Uh, there's other things you can do. You can uh, constantly update your, uh, your uh, IP, but I mean, I wanted something simple and they still didn't change my IP. Um, so what can you do? First of all, Google the hell out of whatever you're buying. Uh, a guy that I met yesterday told me that he could actually re, um, um, the, the device that he bought had, uh, um, a CPU that he could reflash and there was already like an open firmware that, uh, you could use. So that really makes life easier because you'll see what I needed to do. Um, use keywords, um, use Google Translate for Russian and Chinese sites. So this is a guy who basically rewrote um, the Broadly application, like he reverse engineered it. He wrote a new application, a Russian guy. That was very helpful. Um, and it actually works. I, I have no idea how, by the way, like I, I still haven't started reverse engineering that, but I mean, I don't need to because I found something better. Um, what else can you do? You can use an old device. Uh, you could use a sandbox or an emulator like uh, BlueStacks. It's an Android emulator that works pretty well. In this case, both didn't work. Well, an old device did work. Um, you can find and reverse engineer your API yourself. It's not that hard. Like reverse engineering is something that takes a lot of patience and some people are better at it than others, but you will eventually get somewhere like just follow code and, uh, and do like finding files and you will get something. Um, 
And of course, um, once you get an API or you can uh, change the application, you can also customize the device. For example, I guess because no one thought this specific um, this specific firmware is going to be used for a water heater, uh, no one thought about uh, turning it off after 30 minutes when the water is already hot. And I have a habit of forgetting it on for the whole day. So I could just write a simple daemon that uh, checks if it's on and uh, saves a timestamp. And if it's on for more than 30 minutes, just turns it off. Um, a lot of those devices basically come with the basic set of, uh, of, of commands or things that whoever designed it thought of. And they usually don't complement whatever your lifestyle is, whatever you, your use of the device is. So having an API, having a way to control it outside of the app, really opens you up to um, customizing it and making it your own. Um, what else can you do? You can check what the app is communicating with. Uh, there are things like Wireshark, which is a network sniffer, um, Burp Suit, which I'll talk about in a second, uh, OpenVPN, basically uh, tunnel all the communication from your device through uh, a computer that you can, um, you can use to sniff uh, the communication better. And Kismet, which is uh, um, a Wi-Fi sniffer, basically sniffs random, like all Wi-Fi traffic. So these devices are usually Wi-Fi uh, enabled. They're also sniffers for Bluetooth, like uh, people mentioned before. Um, decompile the Android app, again, J-A-D-X, uh, the decompiler. And uh, you can also get, um, um, you can try following the main paths, uh, the buttons, like the on button, see where that goes. Um, URLs, uh, we'll see how that uh, turned out, and logs, and use uh, strings and grep, which are very simple and very fun. Um, Burpsuit gets a special mention because it actually worked and helped me uh, find some cool things. It's an HTTP, HTTPS proxy. Um, you can watch the traffic, uh, your devices, uh, uh, the, the APIs it calls. Um, it's very useful to play with it for REST APIs, which usually uh, these devices uh, try at least to, like they communicate with basic JSON and stuff like that. It can do HTTPS. Uh, if you install the um, certificate, the burp certificate into your device, uh, it can um, basically man in the middle the SSL and uh, you can see even if the device is using uh, safe and uh, encrypted URLs, uh, this device wasn't. It's so, I mean, okay. Um, let's talk about the device itself. Um, basically, uh, I decided to see really what it communicates with. So I opened it up. Um, I realized that it phones home because the, um, the, the app has a, has a feature where you can see the on and off state history. And even if I manually um, pressed it on or off without the app, it's still new. So I started suspecting that something's uh, not quite right and that the device is doing stuff that, uh, uh, well, maybe I don't want it to do, like talk with some remote server. Um, and so I thought, hey, what else can it be doing? Like, does it have like a camera somewhere? I don't know. Let's be paranoid about it and actually check. Um, so, I mean, once you open it, you can see it's a, a Wi-Fi chip uh, from a company called MediaTek. They're super popular. Um, there's a flash memory. There's the electromagnetic relay button thing. Um, the user interface is two buttons and a LED. Uh, that's about it, like some random other electronics, but nothing suspicious, like no microphone or camera. I was really hoping to find something like that. That would have made this talk awesome. Um, okay, so then I thought, okay, let me get the firmware, the code running on the device itself. This is usually more tricky. Um, it wasn't as easy as I expected. Uh, we have a flash reader at work. Um, I, uh, I used it, but the first device uh, we got, like the, the first device I brought for a test that wasn't actually in my home, someone pressed erase instead of read. Um, and well, we had to buy like two more. <laughs> and of course the two here. Um, so the, the MediaTek chip uses some uh, system of a chip uh, that we couldn't find uh, 
um, uh, an instruction set to. There was like some random presentation from a Taiwanese university with some of the instructions, but reversing it is annoying and well beyond like what I wanted to do. That's like hard stuff. Um, but strings still work. Strings is very useful. So first of all, you can see all the embedded uh, access point names. This device is supposed to open an access point uh, that you connect to, um, and then you uh, set it up. But that's not how it works. So I still am not sure how the app itself is doing it, probably broadcasting it. Um, uh, you can see all the password, of course, uh, the server URLs, which are main.broadling and backup. Uh, they have backups, that's good. Um, and uh, just notable that the system of a chip uses something called micro IP. It's a network stack, which has like one known vulnerability and it's, uh, uh, it's, it's really restricted. But once again, the chip itself is very restricted. Um, so at this point, I wanted to start playing with the device, but once it's open, uh, it's not a good idea to connect it to AC anymore. Uh, but thankfully, they left uh, VCC and ground uh, points that I could solder to a USB. Um, so now um, I have a USB connected device. And so that, that was pretty easy. It could have been harder if they didn't just mark it. Um, and of course, uh, it's not really uh, sending any data to the USB. It just powers it. But still, it makes it easier to work with. I'm not going to get electrocuted by it. Um, those are the, the points there. It's super easy. Um, also, I switched the LEDs from uh, blue to red just because I could. Um, so what can you do about the device itself? Um, first of all, you should open it up and see that there's no nothing there that you didn't expect. Um, you can usually recognize the components just by Googling whatever is uh, on them. Um, you can look up data sheets uh, if you want to do something more advanced. Uh, you can make life easier by uh, finding ways to connect it to your computer easier, maybe reflashing it. Um, you can customize it. Um, so for firmware, uh, you can usually find the firmware online or maybe check where the app, um, the app usually initiates updates, uh, you, maybe the device itself, but you can find that by sniffing. You can try reading uh, the firmware from the device, but you'll need some, uh, some um, uh, flash reader that, that's something not everyone has. So maybe hackerspace or uh, you, can, uh, you, can, you can make your own using a Raspberry Pi or something. There are a ton of tutorials online. Um, you can hex edit the firmware and write it back. Um, that's like the next thing I want to do, see if replacing the URLs uh, from Broadlink uh, um, forces it to stop sending information. And of course, you can uh, find a hardware development kit which MediaTek has and uh, uh, see if you can compile your own uh, hardware. That's going to be way harder because once uh, the device is actually in production, the, um, so they usually uh, have it set and this one, for example, uh, the chip itself has some memory with some code that, I mean, it's hard to get. And there's also an external flash drive, uh, which was easier uh, to get, but still. And of course, uh, use your software, right? And like, so that's the read and the erase buttons are so close together that we just, I mean. Um, Cool. So I still had the problem of uh, something is saved remotely. Um, op like um, trying to reverse the firmware didn't really help. Uh, and Wireshark also didn't really help. So now I just grabbed for all the URLs in the, um, in the uh, application itself. And oh wow, I was surprised. So there's a file called apiurls.java. It has like 71 URLs, only 28 are HTTPS because I mean, why, why bother? Um, 55 of them were Broadlink APIs and the rest were like, like I said, just um, APIs of every company that Alibaba, QQ, Weibo, 
uh, no other companies, by the way, only Chinese companies. I don't know why they're discriminating against Google or something. And of course, calling these APIs uh, gives you uh, fun errors like uh, the Chinese JSON. And the API itself that uh, interested me was, of course, the history API. Um, it wanted the token, which was really, uh, really spoiled the fun there. So I could either um, read and decompile, like read the 300 lines of decompilation of how it created uh, the, the token, or um, I could use Burp to find the token and um, send it, and that worked. Um, Basically, I could use the token for like a minute until it expired, or maybe five minutes until it expired, and I had to uh, uh, proxy the app again and find the token. Um, so that was pretty convenient. And I could see that it actually only, um, only returned my history, so nothing too malicious, I guess. I mean, it depends on your definition of malicious. And a totally open source OSINT look at the server. First of all, it's running an ancient Nginx version with a lot of known CVs. Um, there is a valid HTTPS cert, which is not being used. I mean, why bother have an HTTPS cert and then not use it in the application? Maybe it's for newer versions. Um, they left the Nginx welcome page at the, the root of the URL. Um, to welcome you to their site. Um, and of course, I'm not doing anything else. So is this anticlimactic? Well, it, it depends. I mean, it, it's good to know that only my history is saved. Um, I can decide whether I'm okay with it and whether I want it to be saved and I know the extent of what is collected. And of course, I wasn't okay with it, so I just like blocked all of the device's communication with the outside world through the router, um, through parental controls. Um, and now, basically, I had, um, I had my server in my network that can talk to it and turn it on or off, and no one knew about it, of course. So I felt very, very proud of myself. So what can you do? Um, well, the easiest thing is just block everything, right? That's a very good default. Sometimes you do want some features, maybe you want to connect it with remote servers without having to proxy it to your own, um, your own um, web server or your own service. Uh, but you should at least be aware of what it's sending um, and you know, be, be sure that it's okay with you. Um, you could use parental controls, which I think most modern routers have. Uh, you could put the device in the guest network if you don't want it used as a spearhead to uh, hack other uh, computers in your network. Um, and of course, you can run your own DNS and server and try to see like whether you can uh, move the communication the device tries uh, to, uh, to do with the remote server. Um, to your own. The, the fun thing was that I, I couldn't actually resolve the broadlink.com uh, main and backup. So I guess it might be using its own DNS, um, still stuff to research. Uh, there's the three dumb router solution, which uh, basically says put the IoT devices in one network with like a router and then all your other uh, nice devices in another and then have both of them uh, um, both of them connect to another router that connects to the internet, so there's no way for any crosstalk. Um, that's another good solution. Um, some final thoughts. First of all, clients or uh, you know devices that you own are always hackable. It's like a maxim in uh, you know iOS and Android development. Um, the device, the application, whatever, whenever it's not on your server, it's hackable. When it's on your server, it's Harder, but still hackable, of course. I mean, but um, clients are always hackable, and you should, and you can open up your devices. You shouldn't be afraid of it. Uh, avoid your warranties, all of that. And one thing that's sometimes hard is that hardware is, well, at least for me, maybe for a lot of people, is harder than uh, software. 
and sometimes it's not worth your time, but it's definitely something that you can uh, you can do. You can read firmware, you can uh, understand chips, and you don't need to do more than that. Like you will uh, know if there's a weird camera hidden in your uh, water heater. Um, and the important thing is you can add your own features, uh, whether it's in hardware, whether it's in software. Um, you can you can at least try and you should make the device your own. Um, make it um, make it fit you instead of you fitting it and its app and all of the things it's sending to the server and the rest of the crap that's going on there. Um, cool, so thank you. Um, and I'd love to hear some questions. And Actually, I don't see if there are questions. Anyone? Okay, well. Oh, sorry. Oh. <laughs> it's hard to see. There are so many lights. Yes. So I have played around with a few different IoT devices that all came from one company that I think was based in New York City uh, called Quirky. And they all have this very strange um, control chip in them that was all like, it seems like it came off an assembly line and that uh, it used the generic um, uh, API that could just send and receive various like, you know, uh, signed character values or something like that. And it was unique because it was configured by, uh, the devices all had a, um, a CDS cell on them, so like a light sensor on them, and you held up a smartphone up to the light sensor, the smartphone app would flash the screen in a pattern to transmit your Wi-Fi credentials or something to that. I was curious if you'd, if, uh, when you've played around with these devices, you came across anything similar to that. Um, so I haven't seen this specific way of uh, transmitting data. It, it sounds like like those hacks where uh, you try to transmit data with the hard drive light on and off. That's something that was done like a few a few years ago. Um, I guess there are, it's, it's, it seems like it would be very hard. Like it's very low bandwidth, uh, just holding right. it up and very, uh, um, but for devices that don't have any network connectivity, which maybe, Oh, no, these did have Wi-Fi chips in them. This was how they received the Wi-Fi credentials. Oh, so, I mean, it depends. Like, this device also uh, has a Wi-Fi chip on it. it it's very basic. Uh, it's like the lowest uh, MediaTek, the company that makes it, has it. And uh, it, it can act as an AP, an access point, and that's, like, usually what they do. Um, I haven't heard about of that method. But you can also uh, send it to broadcast. There's some ways to do that. Um, that's unique, though. I have another question. Have you taken apart any smart like uh, speakers or anything like that? Um, I don't own one yet, so I haven't taken one apart. No, there was a teardown uh, that uh, there's a teardown on medium of the Echo and the uh, Sonos uh, smart speakers. Uh, it's very interesting, like, uh, the guy who did it tries to understand uh, what it means for the companies, which is a bit out of my league there, but uh, the components and everything is really interesting. Just uh, Google it. It was like on Hacker News yeah, last week or something. Thanks. No problem. Thanks. I actually uh, have worked on both of those things. So, uh, not Quirky itself, but uh, I can answer a bit of that. All the quirky devices, a lot of the ones that use Wi-Fi, have the electric imp inside of them. And you can actually get that as a dev kit. If you're curious about it, you can program it yourself using the, uh, that's how the electric imp gets a Wi-Fi info. What? It's just a company called Electric Imp. Um, and they have dev boards and stuff you can play around with on their own. Uh, I also took apart an Echo. And the <laughs> goal with that is because when I was moving into a new place, I, um, was using it as a music speaker, which it's great for, and you can control it from Spotify on your phone or whatever, but I didn't, I wanted to disable the mics. And that was actually <laughs> my question, is that there's this array of like seven MEMS microphones on there. And I tried dremeling them off, which was not the best idea. 
<laughs> and <laughs> whether it was that or the fact that I probably had some collateral damage, it doesn't work at all anymore. Uh, but I was considering injecting some epoxy into the little holes on them. I'm not sure. But I was wondering if you had any other recommendations for that. I guess I could try and hack into the software side. So um, sometimes, for example, the LEDs on this device, um, they're harmless. Like I could take them off. I don't have to change them to a different color just because I can. <laughs> um, and they're not part of the main electric board. Sometimes, though, uh, these components, like the mics, like in the Echo case, they are part of the main uh, board that makes everything else run. And then you'll need to think of a creative solution. For example, actually uh, start reverse engineering uh, the circuit, understanding what it expects it, uh, like what the interactions it expects is, um, maybe, you know, just emulating somehow a mic. That's also possible. But in this case, maybe some side channel thing, like uh, preventing it from um, transmitting to the internet and uh, it's a good question. I, awesome. I don't have anything smart to say about how to fix it, though. That's yeah, I tried desoldering <laughs> them, and that also didn't work super great. But I'll keep hacking on it. Yeah, you need like you, you need to be trying. That's that's one important takeaway. Thank you so much. It was very inspiring. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Michael, for a great talk. Um, a while back, I'm off, I work in IoT stuff, so it's always fun to see how things get taken apart, and, and I really appreciate everything you've done. There's a project called The Thing System, which unfortunately went poof, um, but uh, it was all done open source, so anyone who's looking to hack their devices, especially the early gen ones, The Thing System was really cool, and they just basically bought everything they could in 2013 and 2014 and kind of did this and published stuff. Uh, and I'd say as well, the other one to look at maybe is OpenHab. I don't know if that came up on your on your list, but it's uh, there's a lot of people that will do the discussion and similar things on, on some of the devices and then try and sort of coordinate them under a, a steward or something that runs on a Raspberry Pi in the home before letting the stuff out too. So um, there's something called Home Assistant, uh, which is awesome, uh, which someone told me about. It has, um, it's basically like a platform to control IoT devices. Uh, it has, um, it, it can talk to a lot of devices and it can do some cool things like, uh, I don't know, uh, it connects to a lot of data sources. So you can say when the angle of the sun is uh, very low, then start the lights without me having to, uh, you know, um, get off my chair and turn it on. Um, that's that's exactly the thing you should be looking for, like whether the device itself um, is supported by platforms like that, open platforms, whether you can reflash it. Uh, for example, this device, I still have no idea how I can get my own custom custom firmware on it. It seems a bit hard, but th the point is try hard things. So I'm definitely gonna try it. And hopefully, I mean, I could do something open source that, you know, I, I don't, that I can, I can know exactly what's running on it. Thanks. Uh, yeah, just on, in uh, response to the question about the, uh, about the uh, optical transmission for the Wi-Fi, the other thing I've seen a lot of with that um, is uh, uh, audio transmission. You'll see that in a lot of, in a lot of uh, IP cameras when they, when they want to connect to um, some Wi-Fi network they've never connected to before. It'll actually, uh, it could be any number of uh, protocols to do it, but it, it'll actually send it out over, over sound to the microphone and the camera and pick it up that way. Um, there's, there are several different ways that you see that where it doesn't exactly want to um, want to connect to, it doesn't want to you know, send out its own uh, AP, but it, it does want you to have some way of connecting to it. Yeah, there's a lot of creative solutions like that. So, I, I mean, it's hard for me to understand why if you already have a Wi-Fi chip that can act as an AP, maybe it can't act as an AP. Maybe it's just some easy way that someone thought of and didn't really think of alternatives. But it also seems like something that would be very uh, uh, error prone, right? Yeah. Although they do use tones that humans can produce uh, usually. Yeah. The other, the other thing that may very well be um, in so many cases, the people building the system are thinking of it in terms of a security camera system or, or that sort of a system. So you're, you're, you're looking at it and you've got, um, you're not necessarily thinking about it in terms of the network side of it, even though you've added the internet to it. 
um, may very well be a reason behind that. Uh, the company I work at, Vidu, um, it's actually an IoT company, although I'm just like a backend developer. This is something I've done like on my own time, but we've looked into, I don't know, like a few dozen maybe IoT cameras and um, there's like every camera you look at has a ton of CVEs and a ton of uh, things that are broken. Um, unfortunately, this is still the state of the commercial security market, like the commercial ca secu security camera market. But uh, that's why we're here, to make it better. <laughs> Thanks for the talk. Um, I have a question. I don't know whether or maybe somebody else in the audience might want to get in touch and say something or get in touch with me. But um, my concern, of course, is cars. Um, so um, I want to find the, um, the wireless um, transmitter in my car, wring its neck, um, and get rid of the microphone in two while I'm at it. Um, so any suggestions for how to go about doing that? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's not sustainable uh -huh. in the long term. I mean, I can think of a few ways just off the top of my head. It's usually connected to something in the OBD. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm sure you can like find someone who's done it before. And if you're the first, then it just means you'll be the one getting all the glory when you publish it, right? Some cars, it's a separate little computer that only runs phone Bluetooth. Other times, it'll be part of the overall telematics module, so you can't you can't always just unplug it without breaking other functions of the car. But you can unplug the microphone. From what I, from what I heard, my information is a couple of years old, but um, from what I heard, I heard they are not car manufacturers are not yet making it so that removing the telematics module cripples and bricks the car. Um, so I don't see any use for telematics or um, microphone whatsoever. I just want to get rid of the whole uh, that whole subsystem. So, yeah. I like Rick the car. That's very sad that we have to use these words now. The other thing that you can always do is jailbreak. That's the word. If you want to keep Bluetooth but don't want think phoning home, the box will have connectors for it for the GPS and the sensors. Just unplug the antennas. Yeah. <laughs> Awesome. Hi. Um, it's great to, to see your research and uh, how you went through um, reversing the, the firmware oh, with some strings and stuff like that. Um, I was wondering, because you know some strings can be packed and they, if people are hiding things, um, was, so was the media chip uh, a separate, uh, was it a separate chip from the SOC? Um, or was it all in one package? It's all in one package. Um, so it also has its own, the, the, the firmware I got was from a separate um, flash memory chip. Um, the, the chip itself also has some memory. So f first of all, some data might be packed, like you said. Although, I mean, why would they bother, right? Um, but some of the, the code might be on the chip itself, which I didn't, uh, uh, that wasn't part of. Uh, it wasn't an easy thing to do, which is something that I pride myself in doing easy things. <laughs> right. Um, okay. I, I was just, uh, that would make it a little difficult for my question, but I was wondering um, if there was any opportunity to use uh, logic analyzers in order to try to extract um, like configuration data for like modems and things like that. Um, no, no. We used uh, um, a firmware uh, reader from the flash uh, memory chip we didn't that's like a specialized device that we have but you can also do it uh, i i mean we could we could try and analyze the board like we said and see what's actually happening and then just remove the chip and try and uh, emulate it with something or another but that's something we thought of but again it's hard right like, yeah. Okay. Thanks. I really enjoyed your talk uh, and really appreciate these kinds of exercises. Um, in the United States, uh, water heaters tend to be, I think for most people, a 40 gallon drum that is either gas or electric and it tends to always be on. So when you turn the faucet on, the water 
eventually gets hot. Uh, there's the newer Flash, you know, hot water on demand. Uh, I was wondering if you could take a minute to describe what this water heater is and, you know, having the switch in the house. Is it a tank? Is it a electric? Um, so that's a good question. Um, maybe I should have uh, explained it a little bit better. I'm from Israel, um, in case my accent doesn't give it away. Um, we have um, drums that are ele electrically heated, um, and the, the drums themselves are usually on the roof of the house. Sometimes you have a solar heater, um, and in this case, it's controlled by uh, basically all you have is a button. And I guess that's why uh, the device is only for the Israeli market, um, the form factor of it, and of course, uh, the way it behaves. But uh, yeah, that's, that's what it is. Water comes from somewhere. <laughs> Magically, yeah. I mean, maybe that's something I should check, where it comes from. <laughs> it's a good answer. <laughs> um, cool. So thank you very much.